All right, so, so we're talking about analogies, and we're using the example of uh, dog, cat, puppy, kitten. There's a structural similarity, right? There's a connection between them. When we're talking about arguments from analogy, what you're doing, instead of going from large groups to members of the groups, or from members of the groups to the large group, you're talking about um, smaller entities. You're talking about maybe just a single person being compared to another person or one group of people being compared to another group of people, or a historical event being compared to other historical events. Um, so here's, here's one example of an analogy. Recently the news came out that flip cam is, is no longer going to be produced, right? So the very camera that we use to make all these class videos. Cisco Systems bought them up, decided that they weren't profitable, and they're closing the whole thing down. As a matter of fact, a lot of people just lost their jobs because of it. Something like, not, not quite a thousand, but close to it. And those were good jobs. Um, now, why, did it, why is it going out of business? Or why is that, that part of Cisco being discontinued, the flip cam? Does anyone know? Why would it go out of business? They just one day woke up and said, add help them. Turned out enough people buying them. Yeah, there, there's sales are not doing very well. Why not? Is there a better product out there? Well, that's a good question. The better product is not another camera. What is it being replaced by? Probably cell phones. Exactly. It's being replaced by multi-purpose devices, they call them, like cell phones, because that flip cam can only do one thing. It can take video, well, it can do several things. It can upload the video. But can it upload the video without plugging it into a computer? No, this can. You can go straight to YouTube from, from an iPhone. I uh, imagine the rest of you who have other platforms can, can do the same, right? I, I don't know that much about them because I only know enough about the iPhone to make it do what I need it to do. I'm not an iPhone junkie. Um, and that iPhone can do an awful lot of stuff. You notice I don't wear a watch. Same sort of deal. I don't need a watch because what's the point in looking like this when I, that's, a, that's a one function device. This is a multi-function device. I can always know what time it is provided the battery charged. So if we think about flip cam being discontinued, flip cam So there's a case, right? And we know why it's being discontinued. Um, it has to compete with a better device. And what's you know what's the ultimate uh, result? taken off the market. Someday, that flip cam, not too, not too long from now, someday that's going to quit working altogether, like all technology does, and then it's going to be a museum piece. Right? I mean, I could, I could put it away and save it you know, for 50 years, and then my kids could probably sell it on whatever the equivalent of eBay is as, as a, an antique. Um, who knows what it'll be then, maybe the chips in our head or stuff like that. Now, can you think of any other products that are similarly being displaced by smartphones. We talked about my watch, right? Yeah. What else? Um, is it households? Like landlines? Yeah. Um, that's a good example. I think there will probably always be some landlines around, right, in case the cellular things go down. As a matter of fact, when I was, when I was thinking about canceling my um, landline, which I have, which I don't use, I only use it to bundle to get a cheaper um, internet rate, the, the uh, person on the other end said, what if there's a hurricane and the cell phone towers go down? I said, eh, okay, for you know, three bucks extra a month, I guess, you know, there are hurricanes here, so I could, I could do that. But yeah, maybe. Um, now that one we don't actually know about yet. So here's another case. Um, land phones, landline phones being discontinued. Um, 
they do have to compete with a better device. That's true. And we don't we haven't actually seen it happen yet, but maybe we can make a prediction that eventually they will be taken off the market. It'd be interesting, you know what that would mean? We would still have all this wiring all over the place, all this fiber optic wiring. What would we use, be using it for? Start pulling it off the ground. What's that? Start pulling it off the ground and sell it. Well, fiber optics you can't really sell for much. Copper you could, but we're not using copper anymore. Um, we'd be using it for the internet. Right? Actually, the internet contributes to, to this because with Skype, you know, Skype is free. Somebody on the other end, they can see you. And if you just, you know, if you don't want them to see you, you can also, you know, adjust your Skype settings so that they they only have like the equivalent of a landline. But you don't have to add the phone to your ear. You can do it from a, a speaker and a, a microphone. There are, in fact, a lot of better products out there. So we can probably predict that there will come a day when you won't be able to buy landline phones. Um, now, this is an analogy. We're saying that because these two cases share a lot of things in common, that they also share this thing in common. Notice, some of these are things we already know. We, we know that um, the flip cam uh, is at risk because there's better products out there. We know that you know, once the older generations actually die off, uh, the ones who are really, really attached to having you know a phone, some of them even still have rotary phones. Once those people are no longer in the market, it's going to be very apparent that there are much better products out there. Um, in this case, this is what happened. We could think of other cases too. We could we could add that. Think back to other things that you remember from your childhood that we no longer use. But they've become obsolete. VCRs. 8-track, you weren't born when 8-tracks were around. I was a kid when 8-tracks were around. Listen to one well, that was an antique by the time you were listening to it. VCRs. VCRs, okay, that's a good example. You remember the video stores that had all the uh, VCR cassettes? And what, what replaced the DVDs? DVDs were a better product. Um, now DVDs are actually, you know, or if you're, if you're relying on DVDs, you're kind of at risk. Blockbuster went bankrupt. Why did they go bankrupt? Redbox. <laughs> Redbox and there what else? There's Netflix. another Netflix. Two, another, two, another red thing, right? <laughs> Netflix, um, their their business model of uh, setting out these these uh, DVDs being out blockbuster. But actually, Netflix now is going more and more to what? What's that? They're going more and more to what? They do video games, sure. Online, but um, you can watch your for movies. movies. Yeah, you just stream the movie. That's why, why get a, a, a DVD when you can just watch the movie there? And more and more of them are getting uploaded into there. It lowers their cost, too. You know, Very much, yeah. So that would be another example of something making something else obsolete. Um, eight tracks were made obsolete by cassettes, which were then made obsolete by CDs, which are being slowly made obsolete by MP3s, MP3, right. You know, if, why would you record a, a CD so you can carry it around and maybe put it in your car? But the newer cars, what do they have? Some MP3 players, yeah. Or yeah, some, some jack that you can use to sync. And eventually, you know, these cars are going to be very, very smart. Um, so we can think of a lot of cases like this. We could go even further back um, to, you know, long before we were, were born. Used to be elevators actually had elevator operators. Mm -hmm. There'd be a guy in the elevator, and he would say, "What floor?" And you, you know, he would pull the lever and take you to that floor. And uh, if he wasn't in there, you weren't going anywhere, right? Unless you knew how to operate the elevator. Um, that's long gone. And why did it go? Well, a better product came out. The what was the product? That panel full of buttons that you push a button and, and the elevator goes. Are there any milkman anymore? Remember how you said? No, I don't think so. You know. Um, 
There might be. But if there were, they would be a luxury product. It wouldn't be something that everybody would have like back in the day. It used to be, you know, my, my grandparents had milk delivered, coal delivered. Yeah, all these sorts of things. Um, and they, that was just uh, uh, three generations ago. So, okay, so you see, we can make arguments from analogy of predicting what's going to happen in the future. The more cases we have to work with, the better our, our analogies are. There's, there's some things that determine how strong your analogy is. And in order to understand that, I think it's very useful to look at the general structure of analogy. So, when you have an analogy, what are you doing? You have some sort of object or case, and you are trying to generalize or, or infer about some other Right? So we'll call this one A and we'll call this one B. And you're saying they have some things in common. Otherwise, there's no point in bringing them up. You don't say dog is to spatula as kitten is to what? What's a, what's a baby spatula? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe one of those really, really tiny ones, you know. But maybe a dollhouse spatula. Barbie spatula. No, what you're saying is they have certain qualities in common. We'll call this quality X, quality Y, quality Z. They might only be one. There might be 23. Um, you know, there's no magic number. Three is not the, the magic number. But this thing over here, this one also has quality X. They share that in common. Like, think about the cell phone and the 8-track, uh, right? Both were facing, or not the cell phone, the flip cam. They were facing pressure from better products, right? That's a quality. That's something they have in common. Being an adult animal, that's something that dogs and cats have in common, right? As opposed to puppies and kittens. Um, now, you can have multiple qualities in common. And if you want a good analogy, actually you need for there to be more than one thing that they have in common. So, you know that they have these things in common. You also know more about this, this object, let's call it quality Q. This thing has quality Q. What you're going to say in an analogy is that, well, because this one does, we're going to say that this also has quality Q. You don't actually know that it does, though, do you? Do we know the future of, uh, what else do we predict? Landlines. Do we, know the predict, do we know the future of what it actually does hold for landlines? No. But we can make a pretty good guess, can't we? And we can make that good guess based on the similarity between cases. So this is one thing that we're, we're looking at. How many qualities do they share in common? The more qualities they actually share in common, relevant qualities, right? The fact that eight tracks were um, made of plastic and the fact that um, flip cams are made of plastic, probably not relevant, right? Or the fact that um, eight tracks were kind of rectangular and flip cams are rectangular, again, probably not very relevant. Um, but the, tech, the fact that they were um, facing pressure from other technology, that's relevant, doesn't it? The fact that the other technology could be manufactured more cheaply, that's relevant too, isn't it? Um, the fact that the other technology was more flexible, these are all different qualities. Um, so when we're making predictions like this, we're relying on um, the structure of analogy. We do this with music recommendations. We do this with movie recommendations. Um, think of two movies that are kind of similar. Not, not sequels, by the way. Because, of course, sequels should be pretty similar to each other, right? What are two movies that are, that are similar that you can think of? By the horror movies. Okay, yeah. Though that's, that's good. There's, there's a genre called horror movies. Let's take zombie flicks, right? Because that's a special subgenre. So what are two recent zombie flicks? Um, there was Zombieland. I saw that recently. It's pretty good. What else? What else is a new one? 
John and the Dead. That was the, the, which one was that now? Was that the George Romero one that had like John Leguizamo in it? And who was in that one? Do you remember offhand? Well, let's take those two. Okay, so if you like Dawn of the Dead, you'll like Zombieland. Right? Why? Well, what qualities do they have in, in common? They've got zombies. They've got people trying to get away from zombies. Uh, if you're into blood and guts and gore and stuff like that, those movies have that sort of thing as well. Any other qualities you can think of that they have in common? Um, well, no, Dawn of the Dead was the one that had Bing Rains in it, right? And Sarah Polly. Is that the one? Was it a, in a mall? That was in Milwaukee. I actually recognized some of the landmarks as, as they were driving through the city. Um, yeah, I like that one. But I like that one not because of anything they had in common, but because it was in Milwaukee. Um, you know, from that area. So, if you watched one of them, and you, you, you liked it, that's quality cue, you liked it, then the other movie that has these characteristics, you're probably going to like that one as well. Um, same thing for restaurants. If you liked this Italian restaurant because they had a nice ambiance and the, the staff was very uh, attentive and courteous and the food was outstanding uh, and you, you liked it, you enjoyed your time there, then this other Italian restaurant which has those qualities, you will probably, again, inductive reasoning, you will probably also like that one, right? So you carry out this kind of reasoning all the time. Um, now, what tells us how strong or how weak these are? Well, think about this issue of, of how many qualities. If they share more qualities in common, should it be stronger or weaker? It should be stronger, right? Yeah. So if you're trying to make a case of why somebody who likes this thing or doesn't like this thing should like or dislike this thing, you want to try to come up with as many reasons as possible. If you're trying to predict the future about a product, many of you are going to be doing this sort of stuff in your, in your work, aren't you? You're going to be generalizing about uh, some of these cases. Any of you who are going into social sciences, education, nursing, business, any of that sort of stuff, you're going to use the structure of analogy. Because you're going to say, this person's case is like this person's case. And we did this thing in that case, therefore we should do this thing in this case. Legal reasoning works like this too, doesn't it? So, Number of, of uh, similar qualities. What else would, would influence how strong it is? What about something that's not on here? What might weaken it? Important differences. Yeah. Um, here's an example. A lot of people want, when, when the Iraq War began, and then it started to you know, uh, accumulate casualties, a lot of people wanted to compare the Iraq War to the Vietnam War. I said, well, you know, Vietnam, terrible war, you know, a whole generation of young men lost. You know, we, we kept throwing more and more resources into it. We kept um, uh, uh, spending blood and treasure on it. The same thing's going to happen with Iraq. Um, now, there are some similarities between the Iraq War and the Vietnam War, right? There's going to be some similarities between just about anything you pick, because, um, you know, anything can be compared to anything. They are wars. The United States is involved. Um, they weren't really that well planned. You know, Vietnam we kind of got into by steps. The Iraq War, the beginning of it seemed to be very well planned. How about the, the occupation? Not so much, right? Um, we were fighting against a, a guerrilla enemy. Um, you know, the insurgents are guerrillas. So, yeah, there's some real issues there. There's some connections. There's some similarities. Are there any dissimilarities? What's the terrain like in Iraq compared to Vietnam? Desert. Yeah, desert is a little bit different than jungle, isn't it? I mean, in the desert, you can, you can see a long ways off. Jungle, you, you really can't see much of anything. Um, so that, that's an important difference. Uh, now, you might say, ah, that's not that important because they're, they're both doing a lot of fighting in cities. And, um, you know, fighting in cities is, you know, very close up. You can't, you can't keep track of what's going on very well. Are there any other differences? You know, in the Vietnam War, we relied very heavily on our technology. We're doing that in the Iraq War, too, aren't we? 
Any differences about that technology, though? It's advanced. It's incredibly advanced. I mean, we can pinpoint with GPS exactly where somebody is. You know, you, you've seen those images of the Vietnam War with the airstrikes, and they'd come through and they just like carpet bomb an entire area. We don't do that. We have these munitions that can go right down a, a chimney. Um, you know, somebody can have a laser sight and point it at a target, and then the bomb will will hit there. So that's a case where one of the similarities might actually turn out to be a, a dissimilarity, and that would actually weaken the argument. Can you think of any other examples? How, how is the, the armed forces that we have today, how are they, besides having you know, higher tech, how are they different than the Vietnam era forces? Well, it's more volunteer, yeah. Is it, it's not just more volunteer. When they volunteer. Yeah, you, you can't get in unless you volunteer. Um, back then we had the draft, and back then you couldn't get out unless you did something like, you know, you proved that you had, you know, only one kidney. They actually tried to draft my dad. My dad had a, uh, a football injury. He, he, he was getting to walk with a cane. And uh, they tried to draft the guy. And he went to the uh, draft board. And the, the doctors, they, they were so big on taking people at that time. The doctors looked at him and said, you're fine. You'll be okay. Now just imagine, you know, 70 pounds on your back with a bad leg humping all around some foreign country. The only way he actually got out, my grandmother uh, made it like her, her cause. And she started calling congressmen and senators and just raising hell. And, and he didn't have to go, thank God, because he would have been, been dead the first week, right? Um, today's Army, today's Marines, today's Air Force, it's all volunteer, isn't it? You can't, you can't get in unless you actually decide to go in. As a matter of fact, there are people who are rejected. You know, used to be back then, if, you know, one of the ways you could get out of going to jail? Exactly. Go in the Marines. Actually, even go in the Army back then. A lot of times, they don't take people with criminal records. Not yeah. In part, because they, they tend not to make very good soldiers in <laughs> the Marines. I'll actually tell you a funny story. Uh, this is kind of a digression, but um, I used to, uh, when I was in high school, towards the end of my, my high school, I used to do a lot of endurance lifting at the, at the Y, because that was the serious place to go lift weights. Um, some of the guys at the Y would actually do their real workout at the Y and then they would go to Vic Tanny to, to try to uh, pick up girls. You know, they, they'd do kind of a pretend workout, you know. Um, but the real workout was at the Y, so we'd all talk and, you know, share a lot of stories. And this one guy, boy, he was huge. His arms were like, like this. And he had, uh, you know, Marine tattoo the way a lot of Marines do. And so I was asking him about that. He said he was, he was a Marine and he was in Vietnam. Turns out he was actually drafted into the army, and he um, he said, "Well, hell, if I'm going to be going to Vietnam, I may as well be a marine." So he went and he joined the Marines instead. Well, you know, when you get drafted, you're in the system, and sooner or later they start sending people to go look for you. So they they sent some some guys from the army, some some MPs, all the way onto a marine base to pick this guy up. And he was in basic training at the time, or boot camp as the Marines call it. I, you know, I'm ex army, so I'm used to army lingo. And apparently, what happened was these MPs came to the formation, and you know, they're all out in front. A lot of you are, are you know, connected to the military in one way or another, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And they tried to arrest this guy. And one of the Marine drill sergeants said, All right, we're going to have a little contest. If you can beat me up, and there are two MPs with, you know, billy clubs. If you can beat me up, then you can take him. But if I beat you up, then you get the hell out of here, and uh, we'll never see you again, and you take the guy off the record. So they had a fight, and this Marine drill sergeant just beat the living tar on these two MPs. Like, you know, hospital injuries. And um, they never bothered him again. <laughs> kind of a... An intro, I, guess, I suppose it's not as funny of a story to you as it is to me. I, I get a kick out of that sort of thing. And actually, you know, I'm ex-Army, so I should be rooting for the Army guys against the Marines. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're, this sort of illustrates what was going on during the Vietnam War. If they wanted you, they were taking you. Now, what did that do for morale? What was the morale of the soldiers like? Pretty low, wasn't it? Um, what about today's Army? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of uh, support services in place. 
But we're still getting guys that are coming back. Um, actually, men and women now because you know we, we've uh, put women in, in, in combat areas. Um, we have a lot of people that are coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder and, and having trouble integrating into, into society, but nothing like the Vietnam War. So those would be differences. And if you really wanted to tell whether it's a good argument or not, you would actually have to tally up not just the things they share in common, but the things where they're, they're different, wouldn't you? Another thing to keep in mind, um, here we only have two things being compared. What if you actually have not just object A being compared to object B, but a whole bunch of other objects going back, more cases? Would that strengthen your argument or would that weaken it? Really? Would it weaken it? More support. It's giving more support, isn't it? The, the more cases that you have where if these things have these three qualities, then they probably have this one. How much do they have any qualities? Just cases without the qualities. There are cases similar to this one, where they, they all share the same qualities and they also have quality Q. So, again, think about, um, let's think about movies. Instead of zombie movies, pick another genre that you guys like to watch. What's that? Action. Action, okay. And what, there's a lot of different, let's say you guys like to watch um, cop movies, or I, li I like actually like watching the British gangster movies. Lock stock through smoking barrels and things like that. So, but it's cop movies where there's a bad guy, usually a drug lord, and he's got a bunch of people working for him. And the, the two cops, it's always, you know, it's almost always two cops. Usually, you know, one's old, one's young, and uh, often, you know, different races, so we can get the whole demographic. They have to infiltrate the organization and take it down, right? Okay, can you think of some movies like that? Leave the weapon, yeah. Or the whole yeah. leave the weapon one, leave the weapon two, leave, right? Um, what else? What are what are other? Movies? You got forty eight hours. Forty eight hours, and then of course another forty eight hours, right? Just like that as well. Um, okay, so we've got two cases now. What what are some other ones? Those are all old ones. Classics now we call those, wouldn't we? Forty eight hours came out when I was a kid. I remember we used to, you know. People repeat lines of movies. Money Train, that's a cop movie. Money Train, I haven't seen that one. Is that, is Leslie that... Snipes and Woody Harrelson, they're cops and they're supposed to protect the train to New York and the guys who okay. did it without money. And same sort of formula too, right? Um, the other guys. The other guys. That's what I'm trying to remember. Mark Wahlberg and Will Ferrell. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was, that was a good one. Okay, so now we got four. Now, can you think of any, are there any movies out like that right now? Is The Lincoln Lawyer concerned like that? I don't know. I, I haven't been keeping up on movies. I'm so busy lately. Any any other cop movies that have come out in like the last year that you can think of that might fit that formula? Um, what's the one with the, 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 the one with the town and the town? The town? The town? Is that what it's called? The town? Okay. And it's got two cops in it and... They have to take down a drug lord. Twelve rounds would be more with you. What was that? Twelve rounds? I don't know. So yeah, again, I'm, I'm so far behind on movies. Let's just say twelve rounds is, or, or the town. Okay. So we have now we have four different cases like this, and we can say, well, they have they have um, action in them. They have some sympathetic cop characters. They have some unsavory criminal types. They have all these categories, in, all these qualities in common. Therefore, the next one that we make like this, and this is the way that Hollywood producers actually decide where to throw their money, isn't it? When, when business people decide we're going to put money into this product, they use the argument from analogy. They say, well, you know, products like this with all these qualities have done well in the past. I bet you the American people would shell out some money to go to the theater to watch this sort of thing again. Um, that's the whole logic behind sequels, too. If you think about sequels, how, you know, how do sequels actually work by analogy? They almost have everything in common, don't they? They keep all the same characters. Usually they'll add one more character. Kill one character off sometimes. What's that? They always add a new one. Yeah. And they'll introduce a new plot twist, but it's basically the same idea. And, you know, the audience will like this one. The audience will like this one. Doesn't always work, does it? 
Now, I'm going to show you something, and we're not going to be able to have it on, on the, uh, the camera, but I'm going to show you an example of something that uses analogy to make sense out of uh, to make sense out of consumer behavior. You guys have a question? Uh, we're talking about Grand Arena. Ah, okay. Well, let's talk about this. So, there's a site out there called Pandora. You guys are familiar with this? Okay, so what is, what is Pandora? It's a, a radio service. What does it do that's, that's different than other radio services? They type in the artist and then they like, do the similarities and then they, they yeah. like, try to predict what someone will like. Okay, that's, that's a good way to put it. You type in an artist, or, or you can actually type in a song. And then it picks out certain similarities. It's using something which is called the Musical Genome Project. And that's a fancy way for talking about uh, how musicologists have come up with something like 800 or so different traits that songs can have, different qualities that they can share in common. So, um, What's a, you know, pick an artist, any artist you like. Drake. Hey, Prince. Drake. Prince, and who'd you say? Drake. There's a jerk like? Drake. Oh, Drake, okay. Blake Shelton. Rolling Stones. Um, I was going to say jerk is kind of, there's probably somebody named Jerk out there, right? Uh, Nick Drake? No. Drake Bell? <laughs> the first Drake. name. Just plain old Drake, okay. So now it's, now I'm not actually going to play the songs, because, uh, it's creating a station that will explore songs and a musical thing. Okay, so here's a song. And let's see, it gives you the, the lyric and... Uh, yeah, I'm in trouble with that. Gives you the lyrics and the... Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, it's got ads. While it's while screwing around there, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this. The musical Genome Project lists qualities of songs. And they have people called musicologists who specialize in music theory. And if any of you have taken a music appreciation class here, or history of music class, or music theory, you've learned some of these, some of these terms. Uh, here we go. Let's back up. Um, why was this song selected? Um, I'm guessing Birdman must be kind of similar to Drake. Is that right or not? I don't know that genre of music. So it says, based on what you've told us so far, we're playing this track because it features club rap influences, southern rap roots, R&B influences, electronica influences, and funk influences. What is it doing there? Oops. It is giving you an argument by analogy. It's saying, we're playing this song. We thought you would like this song. Because it has these qualities, the idea is that shared qualities allows prediction of your likes or your dislikes. And you notice that if you look at it, you see that thumbs up and thumbs down? you can give a song a thumbs up. What it will do then is it will put that into its database and for the channel that you're working with, it will play more songs like that. It will play more songs that have those qualities. And there are you know, literally hundreds of thousands if not millions of songs now in the Pandora database. There are something like 870 or 890 different musical um, traits that it looks for. I actually have a number of different stations that I've been, I've been building over time that have, at this point, um, thousands of thumbed up and thumbed on songs, so it's pretty specific, so I know exactly what I want to, to hear. But every once in a while it will find something new and put it in there. And why does it do that? It makes an argument by analogy. It says, well, you know, you like this, you like this artist because they have this trait, this trait, this trait, let's try this. And again, it's inductive, right? So it's not 100% certain. But it's pretty good for prediction. Um, why? Now think about what makes an analogy strong. 
the more similarities you've got, how many similarities do they have between these two songs? <laughs> There's the lyrics. Uh, how many similarities did we have? We had, we had five similarities. That's pretty good. Um, they'll, next, they'll play something that doesn't have all of those qualities. It'll have um, maybe four of those qualities or three of those qualities. So every once in a while, it'll try out something new. If you give a song a thumbs down, that'll tell it. I didn't like this, and it will start looking for what was the what were the differences between this song and other songs that you've liked. Um, now, the more songs that you do this with, the better it gets at predicting what you're going to like and what you're not going to like. Why? Because with argument from analogy, the more cases you have, the stronger the analogy, right? After a while, it'll get very intuitive. And there are other things like this too. What other websites um, use this kind of behavior to predict what you'll like and won't like and make suggestions? This is making suggestions all the time. Facebook, yeah, Facebook is a great example. Facebook is getting more and more and more complicated in part because they look at all the different things that you say that you like, that you don't like, and it'll make all those suggestions on the side. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about that in, in, in a moment. What else? YouTube. Yeah, YouTube links videos that are connected to each other because they have certain traits. And it'll say, if you like these things, you're going to like that. Um, what about Hulu? Any of you use Hulu? You watch TV? It invites you every once in a while to give ratings. Even if you don't give ratings, it will create suggestions for you. It'll say, well, you like this show, I bet you'll like this show as well. Again, argument from analogy. Any of you use Netflix? Netflix also has suggestions for you. All of these things make these sort of suggestions uh, based on argument from analogy. They're not going by entire groups of things. They're going from case to case to case. So this is one very important commercial application of the argument from analogy. Notice that this is becoming more and more part of our lives. Um, we do this all the time. So. Uh, what was the story I was going to tell you? About Facebook. Oh, yeah. Now, Facebook sometimes will get it wrong. Uh, I think I may have told you this story before. When you switch your status, I mean, first of all, I always get, get a whole bunch of things having to do with professors because it knows I'm a college professor in, in the ads. You know, things like professors travel free, which turns out to be, yeah, free if you can get 12 students to go on a trip, you know, which isn't quite the same. But when you change your status from, say, uh, single to married or to engaged or to it's complicated or any of those other, other sorts of things, Facebook starts changing your ads. It starts tailoring the ads to you. So when I first came here to FSU, I was married. And then uh, I, I got divorced. Well, while you're in the process of getting divorced, are you, are you married or... I suppose, you know, legally you are, but, but as far as Facebook goes, it doesn't really make sense, does it? But you're not quite single yet, so you put something like it's complicated, right? What happens then? Well, ads start popping up, because what does Facebook think that you're probably interested in? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, not a lot of counseling came up. Um, well, what else? Those meeting sites. Exactly. Dating. Meeting sites. Now, Facebook has a lot of information on it. It knows, you know, where you're living, um, what else have you put in, your age, right, whether you have kids or not. So I would get ads specifically tailored to me, it'd be things like, meet women in North Carolina who have kids, or, you know, meet older singles in North Carolina. I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to meet anybody to begin with, but, you know, um, it, didn't, it didn't have anything like, you know, just meet anybody. It was all very, very tailored. Why was it? Again, argument from analogy. If we know these things about people in your circumstances, then we can predict something about you. And you, here's something to keep in mind as we, as we end this. All of you who are in the younger generation, you are the generation that people are reaching out to the most and marketing things to the most. You're the ones that they are trying to capture. So they're using this sort of reasoning on you constantly. The more information that you provide them, the more they're going to do that. There's, there's really no, no way out of that, though, is there? Because if 
you want to participate in the marketplace of ideas, and you want to use services like this, you have to provide them information. But think about Pandora by itself. If they wanted to tailor ads, if they wanted to sell that information to somebody, like say Facebook, to um, you know, pitch ads to you for your favorite artist, they can do it pretty easily, can't they? Because they know, especially if you've linked those accounts, they know exactly what you like and what you don't like. So um, that's where we'll leave off, and I'll.